Welcome to Gold Coast Insider, where we bring you business insights, stories, opportunities, and forecasts from movers and shakers across the Gold Coast. I'm your host, Estelle Rodigiro. I'm CEO of Regional Development Australia Gold Coast. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Mark von Itchstein today. Professor Mark von Itchstein is a fellow of both the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences and a joint recipient of the prestigious Australian Prize. He was also appointed as an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2019 and has won numerous national and international awards during his career. Mark led the team responsible for the design, synthesis and biological evaluation of the anti-influenza drug Relenza, which has been approved for the treatment of influenza worldwide since 1999. This discovery is considered to be a significant outcome and flagship in glycotherapeutic and antiviral drug development in the last century. Mark is the director of the Griffith University's Institute for Glycomics, which is the only one of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere and only one of a few in the world. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Estella. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. Oh, you're most welcome. Gosh. Um, you've achieved so much. So this is going to be such an interesting um, podcast. You were born and bred on a 200, 200 acre farm near Archerfield. And at that time, you were convinced you were going to be a vet. Now, there's a world away between vet and where you are today. So how does a boy from a farm become a world leading scientist and what led to that career change? So it's interesting you say that it's worlds apart. Actually, it's not really, but I'll explain why. So growing up in a farm, um, as most children on farmers do, uh, they tend to want to be involved in farm life in one form or another. Of course, on farm, we weren't just cropping. We were also raising animals. We were dairy cow farmers, um, horse uh, horse farmers, et cetera, horse raisers, et cetera. And so caring for animals, period, was uh, a motivation for me in my early days. It really set the scene growing up in a farm to say, I'd really like to be able to look after animals. Consequently, one option there is, of course, to become a vet. Uh, And so my early career was set about going through a pathway uh, that enabled exactly that. And in fact, I had the opportunity uh, uh, post-schooling when I went to Queensland Agricultural College, now part of University of Queensland, of course, where their main vet program is, um, to undertake initially animal husbandry, an animal husbandry course, which uh, gave me the tools and knowledge around what it would mean to be a vet if I stepped into vet world. At that point, I had the opportunity of traveling to the US as well, and uh, I was uh, quickly accepted into a um, into a university college uh, in in the US to under to undertake, in fact, uh, vet studies. Uh, and uh, initially I thought, well, maybe uh, before I travel uh, off to the US, I'll uh, actually do a primary science degree in Australia. And of course, being in Queensland, there were a few options, uh, one U of Q and one, uh, of course, also at Griffith University, a relatively recently established university back in the day when I started my studies. But the appeal about Griffith was simply that it was very interdisciplinary, right from the outset, and it provided that broad science education that I needed to effectively test the waters in a range of things um, Mm post-agricultural college, now actually a veterinary science. So uh, I did that, and then I fell in love with science, as it turns out, and I always had the intention, even as a vet, to do research. Uh, For some reason, even as a child, I, I enjoyed very much playing detective and understanding, well, there's the problem, how do we solve it? So that was inherently within me uh, from from early days. So I completed my science degree at Griffith, moved on, did a PhD at Griffith, and that's where I transitioned then from saying, okay, I'll continue to be a vet, uh, a training, go into vet, I'll I'll actually do uh, further work in science. And so from that point, um, after completing my PhD, I won a f- major fellowship to move to Germany, the St. Alexander von Humboldt uh, Fellowship, um, and that enabled me to acquire more skills 
um, from the glyc from out of the glyco space that I did during my PhD and my other studies at Griffith uh, into a more more a strategically focused uh, project that that I thought would enable me to do more back in the world that I wanted to move back into when I finished. So as it turned out, that was the case. I successfully completed my fellowship in, in Germany uh, and then moved to Melbourne. I was appointed at, uh, at uh, what became a faculty in Monash University, faculty of pharmacy at Monash University, and uh, that is where I undertook my major work at that point um, in glycoside, establishing a major program of endeavour that really wanted to exploit, uh, I suppose, a lot of the twos and fro's of how sugars, carbohydrates, work in biology. And so that led, at the end of the day, as you mentioned, uh, to the discovery of the anti-influenza drug uh, Relenza, uh, which I was co-awarded the Australia Prize in 1996. And so that was a major outcome in the world at that point. First designer drug against flu out of Australia, uh, commercialized out of Australia with a major UK company. Uh, and uh, that was a, 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 a brilliant outcome, which led to many, many interesting, uh, interesting publications. Now I'm talking about Time magazine, for example, that had the title "Through with Flu," which is quite a fascinating title. Uh, but it was it was absolutely uh, a, a wonderful journey mm. in being able to take basic science, translate that into a drug molecule that went to market, and so. Um, it, it, it that was the beginnings of, of my journey. Wow. So, okay, so from there, from Melbourne, you then ended up on the Gold Coast. So how did that transpire? Yeah, so that, that's a great, a great question. And uh, back in uh, 1999, uh, the Queensland government, the Griffith University, approached me and said, look, um, You've made all of this wonderful contribution to drug discovery, first design a drug against flu. What would it take to bring you back to the sunny state of Queensland? Mm -hmm. uh, the second part to that question is, and where would you want to go in Queensland with Griffith University? So at that time, of course, there was options in Brisbane and, of course, options here on the Gold Coast. Uh, and so for me, I thought, you know, uh, my career path is set. I'm now world-renowned in, in what I do. Uh, the inertia was intense uh, to leave Melbourne, which is a thriving metropolis in itself, particularly in biomedical research. But a light bulb went on to me thinking, okay, uh, if I could establish a unique institute in the country, a unique institute in the Southern Hemisphere that would not only provide for what we were wanting to do, but also for the nation, as a whole, setting up a key resource, uh, that would be a that would be a good outcome, and that would be a legacy. That would be a legacy that I should be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the, the the second question was, well, where would I do that? And of course, um, oddly for some, <laughs> not for me, but oddly for some, I said the Gold Coast is where that should be. There was a Gold Coast campus uh, that was now approaching ten years old in fact, at Griffith University, but had no or very little infrastructure, to be frank, at that time. And had no no institute at all at that stage either? No, no, no nothing at all. So I'm, nothing. I, ground so, zero. In, in ground zero. So in 1999, I said, okay, I'll take that challenge yeah. and establish the Institute for Glycomics on the Gold Coast campus of Griffith University to provide Griffith, Queensland, and, of course, the nation as a whole, um, a unique institute in um, translational biomedical research focused in the field of glyco science um, and that would exploit the technologies and techniques that had led to the discovery of Relenza, for example. So we designed and planned uh, the building buildings that were uh, that are now here of course uh, and none of them were here of course there was nothing here. Nothing. So I, I landed with a handful of, or less than a handful of people in the year 2000, mm -hmm. with investment from both the state government um, and, of course, the uh, Griffith University as itself, 
And also, as it followed on, the local government, the city of Gold Coast um, back in the day. And that arrangement really uh, led me to um, that opportunity. And I said, well, who in this world actually gets the opportunity to start mm. the institute? Mm. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be its director for 23 years, but nonetheless, that's how it's turned out. But we, we started humbly, yeah. uh, I have to say, with no building, um, with li- living, I suppose, in terms of office spacing and a small demountable here on campus. Oh, you were joking. Yeah. And, and some access to um, a, few, a few rudimentary laboratories. But nonetheless, as time progressed, we grew. Mm-hmm. We went to over 220, 250 uh, individuals now within the Institute with further investment both from the University of State and City of Gold Coast to grow us to what we are today, and that's a world-leading translational biomedical research institute uh, with a focus in glyco. So for, for anyone out there who doesn't understand the, the all that terminology, can you just give us an overview of what is the Institute for Glycomics? So, uh, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I just double back too, Mark? And funding has funding always been available. You would have it would have taken an immense amount of funding to get this to the stage it is now. So I guess I'm backtracking a little bit. Yeah. So from a, if I talk about the funding opportunity, of course there are two types of funding that are critical. Uh, one is physical infrastructure that includes equipment, major equipment that's going to be world class and provide us the opportunity to be world leading in the research that we do. So that's one part. And so that funding uh, was provided in the early days through state government and and the university itself. And of course, we've been able to access then uh, through the federal government's relevant schemes, Australian Research Council money for major equipment, uh, also, of course, through uh, through um, national foundations, Australian Cancer Research Foundation, for example, to acquire um, new kit, as well as through donations made to the Institute over the 23 years that we've been talking about. So funding is a critical piece. Uh, without funding, uh, we could not have done anything, uh, to be frank. Uh, it would be mere folly. Uh, so the, the second piece to that, of course, is recruitment of people. Yes. Um, so it, it takes a village, as you know, mm-hmm. uh, to grow reputation, and the village has to be working together. Uh, and so that recruitment piece is equally important as actually having fine, shiny mm. uh, equipment that uh, they can do the job. If you don't have the talented people, uh, then you're not going to go very far uh, as an institute and get yep. the world reputation. So those are the two pieces. And, of course, on, the, on that front in terms of recruitment, Again, both the university and particularly the federal government schemes through the National Health and Medical Research Council and the Australian Research Council enabled us to attract bright stars that said that's a great place to go. And I'll explain why that is a little bit later on. So we were able to recruit high-flying people into the institute, which then sets the scene, bringing that all together for major outcomes in translational biomedical research. Got it. So the institute. Can you, from the humble beginnings, can you tell us where you are now? What is it doing now? And that's pretty for pretty much for lay people who who are thinking, well, we've heard the Institute for Glycomics, but what actually is it, and and how does that translate into our lives? Yeah, very important question. And of course, because we're funded on taxpayers' money, it's very important that we feel that responsibility to be able to explain mm-hmm. uh, not only not only the journey, but also the outcomes, because that's critical uh, to convince the public and consequently the governments of the day that funding um, such institutes is is important through the through its various mechanisms so um, we of course started with a handful of people so our momentum was building back in those early days and the first handful of years of 2000 Uh, but of course now if i look at moving on to 2010 15 now 20 and of course today, 23, um, we've gone from basic discovery science in those early days uh, to a research pipeline. Mm-hmm. That is focused on um, several infectious diseases that have unmet needs, so clinical unmet needs, mm-hmm. uh, as well as uh, areas in cancer and also um, 
neurodegenerative uh, diseases. So th those are the three major areas that the Institute's engaged in. And all of them, all of them are marching forward now with um, various candidates at different stages, whether it's in preclinical research or in human clinical trials. So it's a delight for me to be able to talk about the fact that we have a very consolidated research pipeline. So beginnings to now something that's in things that are in human clinical trials. So examples of that are important to give you. So the, the, the four entities that we have in human clinical trials today, four, mm -hmm. four entities over 23 years, which is remarkable. I would challenge any biomedical research institute in 23 years to be able to put their hand up and say that they've got things uh, through to human clinical trials in that space of time, given the beginnings with a very small number of people. So the first of that, uh, those um, entities are, are a drug candidate, and the first drug candidate that we've now, that's uh, going forward in human clinical trials and will be going to phase two shortly, is an anti-sepsis drug candidate. Huh? Sepsis is a disease, of course, that is fatal. Uh, if it if it progresses, it's common. Uh, it's commonly caused by infectious diseases that run out of control, and at a point, um, your organs in your body, kidneys, liver, etc., just shut down, shut down, and that's the end of life stage. So we've now got a drug candidate that's, as I said, entering phase two human clinical trials. That that we hope will address that unmet need. It is a big problem. It affects multi-millions of people per year and is a major uh, cause of loss of life at that end stage. So that's one. A second one is another drug candidate that is also marching forward in human clinical trials and is already available as a drug um, under a special access scheme, a federal government special access scheme through the Therapeutics Goods Administration. Uh, to treat viral induced arthritis. So that's a remarkable outcome. We actually have on the Gold Coast the first drug uh, that's actually being now prescribed to patients that have uh, have had viral infections uh, that now are, are suffering the consequences of the chronic disease arthritis. And so that's remarkable. First drug candidate out of the Gold Coast wow. through through the work that has been done within the institute. And so that, that will continue then to, to, to march forward in its endeavours in terms of clinical trials to go right through to full market uh, in due course. The two others that I will mention briefly are two vaccine candidates, uh, both in human clinical trials. Now, one is against um, the, the multiple forms of malaria. So malaria is caused by multiple um, uh, uh, different parasites, all belonging to the same genus, plasmodium. And so plasmodium falciparum causes the major form of um, malaria, but there are many others. So researchers in the Institute now have, um, have uh, discovered a, a, and constructed a vaccine candidate mm -hmm. that actually is cross-protective against all forms of malaria. Uh, and so this is now also heading through uh, human clinical trials and we hope will progress during the course of 2024 uh, and eventually end up in a malaria endemic country for further evaluation, like Papua New Guinea or was on the African continent uh, as well. Remarkable. That's truly remarkable work. Mark, mm -hmm. is there lots of um, malaria around still? Like you, you don't hear of it, but yeah. obviously it's still, yeah. Multiple millions of cases worldwide. Of course, wow. it's, not, it's not endemic in Australia and Again, um, children lose their lives every multiple seconds, uh, in fact, as a consequence of malaria. Strong pre presence of maternal malaria also still in the world, mostly in underprivileged uh, countries, and that's why we still need a very good solution. Yeah, absolutely. So we're thrilled about that. And the second mm -hmm. one um, is a second vaccine candidate uh, that is marching forward is one against uh, Group A strep. Now, mm -hmm. group A strep, Streptococcus A, causes uh, multiple diseases, uh, some as simple as tonsillitis, uh, some more complicated as rheumatic heart disease, skin diseases, et cetera, uh, with no vaccine currently available. So our clever researchers have discovered, again, uh, a, a vaccine candidate that is cross-protective against the multiple strains of group A strep, 
There's more than um, many. There's more than 10, 16 uh, variants um, of this organism that causes significant disease uh, right across uh, developed countries and also, of course, um, undeveloped uh, countries, also particularly in indigenous populations, I must say. So it's a prevalent organism that causes significant disease in our indigenous people, but also indigenous peoples uh, around uh, around the world. Uh, in fact, so that is marching forward as the um, as a vaccine candidate, which we hold great hope uh, for. But again, as as things progress through human clinical trials, it's always high risk, high win. Uh, so we always uh, are looking forward to the next set of data that will come from that trial. So there there are four, therefore, that I've just described candidates in human clinical trials, of course, backed up with a long research pipeline and preclinical work, mm. and I dwell on all of those, but there are many uh, that mm. are now progressing through those preclinical studies as well, which is very exciting. It is exciting, Mark. And how, what, if there was a frustration in that pipeline, what would it be? Because how long does it take to get a um, vaccine or a, a drug that, that you've developed and it goes through preclinical and then it'll go to human human clinical trials. What what is that what is that pipeline? And is there a frustration in that pop pipeline? Yes, How so, it take yep. the market? Yeah, yeah, so they're all all great questions. And so, you know, of course, uh, again, everything takes money, investment. Um and and so the time frame typically uh for drugs slash vaccine, it, it can vary depending on where you started and what the candidate is about. Some can be quick, some can be in principle as quick as five years. That's really rapid. And they can be quick if if this drug is already approved for another condition. Okay. Yeah. And so that can be quicker uh, if it meets all the criteria in the new uh, indication. But of course, if it's from, from uh, grassroots level, it starts, it's going to be a 10 to 15 year process. Um, in fact, vaccine candidates are very similar um, and they need to go through all the, jump all uh, through the hoops and over the hurdles that one has in uh, classically to, to meet all of the, um, uh, the regulatory authorities uh, needs in terms of safety, of course, if efficacy, all of those things that are tested uh, in human clinical trials. So, uh, the, the important piece to that, of course, is investment in terms of funding. Mm -hmm. So funding to both drive things through clinical trials, uh, preclinical trials, I'm sorry, and then clinical trials, it costs an enormous amount of money. And that, of course, is where both industry as well as, of course, the federal government can play significant roles. And already the federal government plays its role in terms of investment in preclinical work and to an extent also in some clinical trial work. Um, and that needs to be ramped in my view right now because uh, there are many things in the pipeline that are looking in good shape that need that investment. In industry, of course, whether it's um, industry in the context of uh, pharma, biotech, uh, or indeed uh, VC, uh, venture capitalist investment, all need to play their part in advancing these Australian inventions, not just here, but right around the, yeah. around the country, of course. So this is, again, from a layman's point of view. Um, so once you've developed a, a vaccine, um, can that, can that and it goes through all the, the, the clinical trials, can that be developed in, in Australia or does it have to go offshore? Or is, is that just a ballpark? Is that a stupid question from the point of view that it depends on what it is? No. So, that's a, oh, again, very sensible questions. Uh, and the answer will vary depending on the nature of the vaccine uh -huh. or the drug. So we are driving uh, phase one, phase two trials in this country. Uh -huh. uh, as well as internationally. So we don't want to necessarily just package technology up and send it away and say, well, we've done our job. That, that leaves the country with a certain outcome, which is good. There's a candidate marching forward, but we prefer to be engaged and taking it hand in hand with our partner. If we get to that, that uh, extent of engagement to say, okay, let's co-develop this right through to, to market with the expertise that we have. Of course, at a point, 
the industry partner will have much more expertise in knowing how to finalize and market. That's, that's their job, not an academic institute's job. Uh, but we like to be involved as long as our expertise is relevant. Yeah. Okay. So in that 23 years, I think that the, the Institute is now home to one of the world's leading, largest, biggest um, vaccine companies. Uh, so Griffith University um, uh, with, uh, with University of Queensland have engaged with Sanofi. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have now on this campus, and in fact, it's associated with our space in the Institute for Glycomics, an office uh, for our Sanofi uh, folk that is uh, fantastic. Of course, it's a fantastic outcome and shows the commitment of Sanofi, of course, not just to, to Griffith University, but also to Queensland as a state because uh, of the talent pool that, mm -hmm me and the rest of the state actually have. So I think that's true recognition of the talent uh, that we have established. Yeah. So the city's strength as a hub for medical science is a major pillar of the Gold Coast economy. I know that RDA, Gold Coast, us and our stakeholders are currently undertaking the Gold Coast Emerging Biomedical Industry Project, and that's in response to the, the biomedical industry being the city's fastest-growing industry. And it's an industry which contributes $300 million annually to the city's economy and a total effect of $592 million, which is expected to double in the next decade. Um, so, Mark, given that growth and given the exponential growth that we, we are going to find within that, um, within that sector, what do you see now as, as the future for the Institute for Glycomics? Like, where to from here? Uh, are we going to continue to to engage and draw in those international investments? Yeah, and so the, I think that's the critical piece. So I, I, I didn't quite finish why I moved to the Gold Coast. Oh, I mean, sorry. Gold Coast, <laughs> ago, but the Gold Coast was an untapped resource uh, in many yeah. ways and had the features of lifestyle um, as well as potential, potential back that many years ago, 23 years ago, to become a world leading hub in biomedical research. And it's very interesting to see nowadays, of course, the importance of lifestyle to attract people. You've got to have a safe environment. You've got to have, uh, of course, beautiful harmony in nature that, that people say, I would love to live there uh, because it's beautiful beaches, beautiful hinterlands, forests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also world class. Uh, facilities, research facilities that I can do the job that I wanted to do. So I think uh, they, they were the magic formula that I had back in my mind and why I selected in part the Gold Coast because it was untapped and I could see how it could grow mm -hmm. uh, something better than what it was. And indeed, that's the, the music to my ear that you just rehearsed in terms of what the biotech industry on the Gold Coast looks like now is phenomenal. Idiot. And in our own way, we hope that we've contributed to the validity uh, of the Gold Coast becoming a biotech hub yep. in the sunny state of Queensland, of course, within, uh, within Australia itself. So I think um, it's, it's fantastic as an outcome. And where do I see it going? Yeah. I see whether we will continue to contribute to that growth with the health and knowledge precinct right here. We're a part of that, mm -hmm. right a part of with all the, the hospitals, uh, the, the research hospitals that we have right here on the Gold Coast in that precinct as well. So it's a blend that is the right formula to see major success. And I would challenge anywhere in the country to say that they've got the same I guess, environment, microenvironment that said you've got your hospitals right with you, you've got your un universities right with you, and you've got your industry partners coming in right with you, all co-located. Well, that is brilliant. That is the right formula and is so reminiscent, so reminiscent of what San Diego and La Jolla in the US and California did that many years ago where they started off in San Diego as a naval base. La Jolla had a, a couple of outstanding biomedical research institutes, and they still do. And that pool with the University of California, San Diego, 
with, of course, um, those biomedical research institutes collectively work together now to establish a major biotech uh, community right in San Diego. And then, uh, depending on who you speak to in the US, uh, they'll be number one, two or three <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in the nation. And so I saw that and I said, there is no reason why the Gold Coast can't be like that. Mm -hmm. We need to aim towards that. And I'm so pleased that the investments made by the university, investments made by the city of Gold Coast, by, of course, the state government as well right here, uh, has led to that. Yeah. We need more, though. We cannot stop investment in all of the funding schemes um, that have been tapped into over the years. National Health and Medical Research Council, its budget has deteriorated, unfortunately, over the years. There have been other pieces that have come into play, and that's okay. But nonetheless, um, if we lose our bright minds because the success rates in those schemes have declined, we're not going to attract new people in that will effectively join the industry pipeline. If mm. you understand what it, they won't want to get a PhD. Mm. They won't want to do research in an academic institute like this, even though it's fantastic and wonderful. If they can't see the the, the pathway to a new career, because there's not enough wins or available funds at those early stages, we'll lose those smart people. So I think that's a matter for the federal government particularly to look at. Yep. RDA, particularly, given that we're on the Gold Coast, um, and uh, I would just uh, encourage our federal government uh, leaders, ministers, and, of course, the various departments that are, um, that are involved in, in those decision-making processes to think about the strategy around that. And that's not putting a hand out. That's simply saying we need to address that situation right now. Mm -hmm. And... Mark, I guess the whole thing's changed. So has COVID, the COVID pandemic, I think you've been voiced to say it's a warning. Um, are we now in a position that that has actually changed the um, the speed at which we have to do things? I mean, that was a very fast-tracked one. Has that has that influenced what we're looking at going forward? Is that it should that influence what we're looking at going forward? It has influenced uh, how we look at things and opportunity. Uh, I it, it doesn't change the usual approaches that we've had because the usual pr approaches that we have had have delivered. Okay. Uh, in many ways, the new the mRNA technology, which they were awarded the Nobel Prize this year for, um, for their discoveries that many years ago, not for the pandemic, but for the fundamental discoveries around the potential of mRNA, Mm -hmm. uh, the the matter is is that we need that blend of approaches to say okay we need drugs and vaccines mm -hmm. because if you can get drugs as well you can save lives when people get infected as you discover vaccines yep. uh, going forward so i think there are multiple ways that we need to be able to support all forms of drug and vaccine uh, discovery including now how quick mrna vaccines were able to be developed it wasn't simply because, um, oh, wow, here's mRNA, it, it's the new new way only. Industry and government work very closely together to understand how we can um, streamline, streamline without putting at risk, streamline without putting at risk a vaccine into, uh, into patients, and that's exactly what happened. So normally things would be done end on end, Yep. You'll get your point and say, okay, we'll move forward. This time they were trying in the earlier parts of the work to, to overlap pieces to shorten the overall time frame. Oh, good. So until recently, oh, well, no, well, soon you will be step, stepping down as director of the Gold Coast, uh, of the uh, Griffith University Institute for Glycomics. What, what, what will be your direction once you step down and, and what preempted that, that move? Uh, um, so after 23 years at the helm, mm -hmm. I think anybody sensible would say, hey, uh, <laughs> this is probably an opportunity to focus uh, on on pieces of my own research puzzle uh -huh. to advance. So I've got, I mentioned an antisepsis drug. That's actually one of mine that's marching through human clinical trials now. I've got other antiviral drugs that uh, I'm very excited about 
that I hope will move into human clinical trials shortly. So for me now, I want to be at the other end uh -huh. uh, of the spectrum, focus on translating more uh, drugs and potentially uh, vaccine candidates, uh, uh, primarily in infectious disease, but not only, also in the cancer space. I'm excited by that uh, because uh, I really see major opportunity of actually getting another drug and or vaccine from my own research work to market mm -hmm. in the time that I have as a researcher. And if uh, I was and am still a National Health and Medical Research uh, Council investigator, uh, and that this new, new direction for me is becoming a distinguished professor at Griffith University uh, in the institute will enable me to be much more translationally focused without having to worry about administrivia. Yes. I'm very excited, very excited by that opportunity. I think that's a, uh, that is the, and should be the expectation of the taxpayer that the money that I've been awarded to do my research really now can push, push those things forward. So back on the tools, Mark. Back on the, back on the tools, exactly. That's back it. The tools. Um, so, so given given the growth, the exponential growth and that we've been discussing and and where we need to be and the impact that um that pandemics are having on on our world, what is required from your perspective um, on the ground now to continue to allow the institute to and and the biomedical world to continue on the Gold Coast. What is required now? What, what do you need now? What do you think is the most 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 you know important aspect that you'll need to be able to address all the everything that's happening? Yeah. So I, I think right now what is required is that human infrastructure investment. Right. Okay. We, we need to, and by that I mean it's not just winning more grants it's actually being able to make to, uh, the proposition to students from high school up that there is a genuine career path here in biomedical research join join it become a part of the workforce uh, as i was just discussing before so investment mm -hmm. in human infrastructure now is important and that's a job for uh, all levels of government and universities and universities to play their part and as i said right now we, I see people walking away at the at the early career researcher stage and middle career researcher stage because the success rates in our schemes are just simply way too low. We're off kilter, which is not going to assist our industry, our biotech industry that we're trying to flourish. Uh, and so I, I am concerned about that. Mm -hmm. So I think it needs as as you know right sizing. Our defence force, uh, right-sizing our mining industry, looking at rare earth metal uh, um, uh, uh, development in terms of processing and taking advantage of what we have in the country is critical. Biomedical research, biotechnology is all a part of that, and the governments and industry have a role to play here, as tertiary education institutes uh, like Griffith University also do right yeah absolutely and um it's you know our um, jobs growth is proportionally faster and uh than the rest of the economy in that biomedicine and the medical technology so that is probably going to be something that's really vital that we look at to encourage that um, continued um engagement absolutely um so from your you, you travel frequently around the world i'm sure Yes, you do, but you've always you've always said you want to live on the Gold Coast, or you're going to stay on the Gold Coast. What is it about the Gold Coast that keeps you that draws you back here, Mark? Well, I think it was exactly the same thing that brought me here, <laughs> um, in the sense that the Gold Coast, well, it's even more so now. Uh, it was more of a vision back then, but the Gold Coast now has matured. Yeah. It has matured uh, in really consolidated its position in this nation as a major player in uh, biomedical research and also a major player, I think, internationally, post-Commonwealth Games particularly now. We've opened the, the door, so to speak, where people are coming from all over the world. And they're not just seeing surf and sand or the beautiful hinterland and forests. They're also seeing now, wow, there's a thriving 
range of industries from biomedical research, biotech, through to, of course, space. Mm. It's absolutely phenomenal what the Gold Coast has transitioned into. And, you know, it was always the master plan, I know, of the city of Gold Coast particularly, to become more diverse uh, in its economy. Uh, naturally so, because uh, as soon as you don't, uh, we see what could have happened in the pandemic where if you don't get tourists in, you, your whole business shuts up shop. Now, of course, Gold Coast suffered as a part of the pandemic and tourism, but at least the other parts of the economy on the Gold Coast were able to keep on going. So th that why I'm here is because of what I've seen now and what the investment uh, has led to. And it, it isn't over yet. It isn't over yet. There's much more to come. And I'm just thrilled to see the direction uh, of, the, of the Gold Coast and its community. The community are so committed. I'm not talking about the broader community, the general community, are so committed to see these developments happen and are also investing in it, whether it's through investment or whether it's through donations, uh, for example. That engagement piece um, is so important for us. And again, you know, they're, they're very, I think the Gold Coast community are very proud uh, of where we are at as an institute and feel ownership. That was always my mindset to say, I'll create something not just for the university or for the Gold Coast, but for the community, because the community are those folk that need to be proud of what the Gold Coast is doing. It gives more job opportunities here on the Gold Coast, whereas before, 20 years ago, most most children, as they went through school, would think, I've got to go to Brisbane now to do my higher education or get a job or leave, this, leave the sunny state of Queensland altogether. And that's a shame, whereas now that's very, very different in my view, very, very different. No, you're absolutely right. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, Mark, and to hear everything. You're very passionate. We're so fortunate that 23 years ago you you um, had that thought to come to the Gold Coast. You've, it has built up to be, as I said, a multi-million dollar sector or industry on the Gold Coast. Um, so thank you so much for giving us some um, time today and your insights and, and um, hearing a bit about the story. It's a, it's a real pleasure, and I should say, say that over the 23 years, we've brought income in of $270 million wow. into the Institute, just to let you know. As I said, we're over 250 people now with many things in human clinical trials, which is simply remarkable yes. uh, for an Institute. But as I said, there's so much, uh, so much more to be done, and I'm looking forward to the next leadership that will come in and drive this Institute up to the next level. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks for listening today. For a complete list of podcast episodes and transcripts, go to rdagoldcoast.org.au slash podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn or Twitter.